The male sandbar's antlers dislodge and fall off once a year. In mid-spring, when the mountain snow has not yet fully melted, the short, furry antlers have already sprouted anew. They grow very fast, and the hairy skin begins to shed. By May or June, when the rhododendron blossom, the antlers are fully grown. However, we can still see some hairy skin not still attached. Going from no antlers to full antlers usually takes about three to four months. During this time, the male sambar is in its most stable temper. The body of the sambar is strong and elegant. A fully grown male sambar can weigh up to 200 kilograms. On the other hand, a female sambar is smaller. Of the five largest kinds of sambars in the world, the Formosan sambar is the smallest of its species, but it's still the biggest mammal in Taiwan. According to Darwin's views on evolution, every kind of animal today has its corresponding way of living. Maybe if we can use the information we already have and boldly assume the sambar's behavior, we may then confirm it by long-term observation in the wild. There are two big ears on the sides of a sambar's head. Its other surrounding detector is its ultra-sensitive nose. It is still able to sniff the faintest of scents from far away. The sambar's eyes are on the sides of its head. It can see its surroundings with a sight angle of about 300 degrees. Its rectangular-shaped pupils enable it to see the entire horizon. When it dips its head, its eyes are still able to look up with a large degree. It keeps its vision the same way it is while standing, so as to be in a constant state of awareness. A pair of pre-orbital glands as big as the eye sockets will open and give out a gas when threatened. These also work as markers of their territory. The high mountains of Taiwan are very treacherous but the sandbar's muscular legs and big hooves still allow it to cope with the difficult terrain quite handily. Although not quite as agile as goats, it still manages an acute nimbleness when treading on rocky surfaces with ease. The sandbar walks firmly step by step. One front leg rises up. Then the hoof stamps into the dirt at a 45 degree angle. When it finds its footing, the foot steps down fully. Then it takes a next step. This is because its legs have to support the entire weight of its heavy body, so it needs to be very cautious while walking. Most of the high mountains in Taiwan are young, and the river valleys are steep. For large animals like sandbars, traveling in the river valleys is not an easy task. But we often see sandbars strolling along wider sections of streams with relative ease, enjoying the sun and the cool water. But compared to the riverbeds with myriad small pebbles, sandbars seem to still prefer the muddy riverbanks. These ponds are just like the sandbars' natural bathtubs. They love to play and roll in the mud. In the meantime, it also helps them get rid of unwanted pests. At 3,000 meters above sea level on the expressionless highlands, what kind of plant can provide abundant herds? The answer lies in the dwarf bamboo that carpets the mountains. The dwarf bamboo is a member of the grass family and is also the most commonly seen plant in the central mountains of Taiwan. Occasionally, sandbars will also eat the Taiwan red pine. When winter approaches, the dwarf bamboo turns into no more than rotten and dead leaves. The sandbars will turn more to red, hairy rhododendron. To get enough nourishment to support its large body, the sandbar's most important work is to eat all day. When eating grass, a sandbar will first tear it in half, grind it to a pulp, 
then swallow it. The plant is hard to digest because of its high fiber content, so the sambar needs a long time to ruminate. If we closely watch the sambar's neck, we can see the vibration caused by the food coming from the stomach back to the mouth. On these highlands, apart from human interference, the sambar has virtually no predators. But the sudden change of weather, however, may be potentially even more harmful. A strong cold front in late March covers the entire mountain with a blazing snowstorm. After the weather improves, within one square kilometer, we found four bodies of dead sandbars. Were those sandbars frozen to death due to a sudden temperature drop, or did they die of other causes? The sandbars continue to be one of the woods' greatest mysteries and continue to call me into their footsteps. The sandbar has always been an elegant creature and by no means should it be perceived as a dim-witted animal. Its hind legs are like springs and can jump very suddenly and has little problem jumping long distances uphill. This enables it to escape from danger into the deep forests faster. When a sandbar is threatened or in danger, it will nearly always make for the lush green forest. The sandbar's brownish fur makes an ideal camouflage as it disappears into a sea of leaves. To sum up the above features, we can outline a paradise for sandbars to dwell in. There should be gentle slopes of grass with strips of forest and scattered ponds and lakes. A slow stream would make it even better. This is just the classic habitat for sandbars. By building this sample, we are able to do long-term and stationary observation. Therefore, I entered the world of sandbars and became enthralled in recording a day of the sandbar. You can say that a sandbar's day really starts in the afternoon. Afternoon, the air becomes denser and wetter. The fog covers the entire mountain, so it gets cooler. The sandbar starts to come out and eat in the evening. They normally do this alone, yet sometimes they gather in groups of three. 